Hello and welcome to Experience Data Talk, a time when we get together each week to talk about big data and analytics. At Experian, we believe that big data is good, good for our economy, good for consumers, and good for society. Today, we get a chance to talk with Charlie Burgoyne about ways to leverage data for user engagement and product development. Charlie serves as the Director of Data Science at Rosetta Stone and guides the vision and implementation of Rosetta Stone's data science initiatives. Prior to Rosetta Stone, Charlie has held a variety of roles, including Vice President of Research and Development at a technology firm, a research scientist for the US Department of Energy and the National Nuclear Security Administration. He also served as a research astrophysicist for NASA. Charlie has a real passion for languages and speaks French, German, Italian, as well as a little Russian, Farsi, and Arabic. Charlie, thank you so much for being part of our data talk. How are you doing? Oh, thanks so much for the invite. Um, I'm doing great. Uh, been very busy time in my field, as you're probably very aware. So uh, I'm happy to, to get a chance to talk and expound on what we're up to. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, before we get started, Charlie, when did your love of languages start? It's amazing how many languages you've learned. Um, that started <clears throat> very early on for me. Um, my father uh, speaks fluent French, and we, we spoke French growing up. And uh, middle of high school or so, I got very interested in Italian, um, and from there, I uh, learned German and um, really perfected those three languages before I, for professional reasons, had to learn a bit of Farsi, Arabic, and a little bit of Russian. Wow, that's absolutely amazing. Are there any languages that you're learning right now? Um, I'm actually taking the time to go back and, and uh, really focus on Russian. Uh, I know about enough Russian to get from point A to point B. Really rudimentary, but it's a beautiful language, and it constitutes a new... Uh, foray into uh, characters and phrenology, and uh, it's a new experience for me. So, well, that's really cool, Charlie. Um, so, let's talk a little bit about yourself. Can you talk a little bit about the work you're doing in data science right now? Uh, absolutely. <clears throat> uh, we're kind of we're seeing this very interesting transition uh, within the field of data science as well as back end development and um, analytics, where we're reaching what I call design symbiosis. That's where designers and architects and engineers are actually able to construct uh, computational models and computational analytics based off of the world that they naturally observe. Uh, for example, instead of having to treat, if you were given the task of trying to um, count all the cars as they migrated through traffic uh, within a particular city, let's say, uh, all throughout Chicago or Austin, um, typically you have to access all that information through a SQL table or an Excel type spreadsheet. Um, but now we're being able, we're able to consider those cars or those elements of interest as their own disparate objects, and we have the computational power behind it to treat uh, to build ontologies that replicate the world around us. That makes sense. Charlie, are you seeing just tremendous growth in that area as there's more sensors and more devices out there to track information? Uh, I'm seeing <clears throat> probably the most exciting thing I'm seeing are the use cases that are spilling out um, from one industry to another unintentionally. And I think this is kind of, uh, this is kind of the, the, the biggest characteristic of such a nation field, a nation field where we have um, target identifying when an individual is likely to be pregnant based off of her spending habits. Uh, Uber is able to show uh, very serious crimes and um, violent in interactions based off of, and fidelity for that matter, uh, based off of the transactions that are taking place with, within, their own, within their own application. Dating sites that are able to write very interesting case studies on anthropological uh, evolutions within, within American culture. And so what I'm getting at is that <clears throat> By treating data in the proper way, not only does it have the potential to serve your own business needs very aggressively uh, and, and address problems that you face as a business since inception, but now you're actually able to comment on things that are outside of your normal realm of ownership uh, with empirical data. And it's a fascinating time. Charlie, what, what led you down the path to begin working in data science? Uh, I started out, as you mentioned, <clears throat> in astrophysics predominantly. Uh, studying the governing dynamics behind many body systems. Uh, what is it that keeps billions of stars interacting with each other and, and the guiding forces behind uh, basic physics applications? When I was in graduate school, I realized that I wasn't as 
concerned with the particulates that I was studying, right? The stars, the muons, or leptons, or gluons. What I was more interested in was um, the systems themselves, right? This this governing system of equations that define the rules for ecosystems, and that's a very transferable skill, right? When once you once you go from studying stars within a galaxy, there are a lot of parallels to studying nodes within a gigantic network, mm -hmm. and so that that foray from originally from um, uh, physics to neuroscience to uh, cybersecurity. Now I'm in uh, cognitive uh, uh, neuroplasticity, really, uh, with languages. Has been a very uh, it, it, there really haven't been that many degrees of separation between my previous experience and the one that followed it. Um, so for me, it's all it's all very much the same. It's studying the governing dynamics between large complex systems. Charlie, I'm, I'm a big fan of Reddit, and there's a subreddit called Explain Like I'm Five. And so I'm curious, how do you explain to someone what you do for someone who's not in data science? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I guess probably the easiest way to explain what I do is twofold. Uh, one, to a professional who's not familiar with data science. I, I make data useful in as, the shortest sentence, sentence as possible. Mm -hmm. um, but if I were to have a five-year-old niece or nephew who are inter who's interested in what I, what I do, um, I think it's very fair to say I view the world in a different way and I quantify that, that view as best I can. That's awesome. I love that definition, Charlie. Um, let's talk a little bit about your role at Rosetta Stone. What type of teams do you work with there? Oh, I'm actually very heavily involved with several of the teams um, at Rosetta Stone. My predominant focus is engine within the engineering team. I have uh, several engineers under uh, my department. But I also have a lot of interaction with the language learning group, uh, individuals who are typically linguists or anthropologists, individuals who are very interested in the act of learning itself. And together, we define the strategy for content development and how that plays into the data as we collect it. Um, what we're finding more and more in this new epoch within the information age is a shorter continuous iterative cycle of development where the data that's being used for creating new products for R&D, for LLP or language learning in our case, is actually the same data that's being used by business intelligence and strategy and marketing. Right? It's very much the same. I'll give you an example. Um, from my perspective, and I, this has been uh, a, a big focus for me since I originally came to Rosetta Stone, I truly treat the most important objective for my team to, to be essentially to create object-oriented, super granular content. What I mean by that is instead of going through a lesson that's 10 minutes long and having that exist as a single entity, I want to know what word you use to try and say apple in German or Russian, right? As, as minute, as granular as I can possibly get. Because what that allows us to do with object-oriented, super, super granular data is to be able to build an adaptive experience. I know, I know, I don't, I know that you got this whole exercise wrong, but now I can also tell you what elements within the exercise you got right and wrong. And as that modulates, you, the user becomes more engaged with the product. As the user becomes more engaged, the product becomes more efficient. As the product becomes more efficient, then we can increase in our ROI by having recurring revenue and then also the building out the brand and, and brand recognition. So as you can see, the, the structure of the data has a very compelling case to have a direct impact on, on our ROI in the, in the greater business case. Charlie, how much of this, um, as you're like planning these things out, how much of it is you like actually looking at the data, developing algorithms, and how much is it of you working with other teams to find out what they're thinking about these different issues? Uh, that's also a great question. Uh, I've, I've bifurcated my time into two different main objectives. For a, a typical day in the life of Charlie um, consists of for, first understanding which products we have currently in the market, and there are many, many that Rosetta Stone actually offers, and identifying ways that I can manipulate the data or transform the data or put it through an ETL process for any of your data scientists who are more familiar with those terms. Uh, that's extract, transform, and load. It's a way of normalizing big disparate sets and putting that into a new architecture. Um, that's about half my time. And then the other half of my time is developing new techniques once that data has been normalized for regurgitating uh, or creating new metrics for users and uh, organizers within our E&E space. Charlie, what kind of data are you analyzing? 
uh, predominantly a focus on learner data. So uh, when, a, when a user opens up a Rosetta Stone application, what are the actions that they're presented with? What are the actions that they take in response? How much time occurs between each of these actions? These are the things that we're, we're working towards within Rosetta Stone. Um, and <clears throat> what we're finding is that you can really ex you can extract very interesting information about the users based off of these little metrics. Uh, probably our most uh, metric intensive, one of our most metric intensive products is a product focused on helping children learn. And we're able to extract interesting information about the demographics of the children who are learning, uh, interesting deltas between one experience and the other that, that show levels of engagement and efficacy of the product. Uh, and really, we're working our way towards being able to infer accurately um, through empirical data how uh, effective and, and, and how uh, salient our product is for our users. Wow, I can't even imagine like what the difference in the data, how it looks when you're looking at what a child is using your product versus an adult using your product. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> it's actually very it's fascinating you bring that up. We've got a really ex excellent team that's focused on uh, user analytics and qualitative assessment for, for users. Um, in fact, some of our offices, ours in particular in Austin, has a, a room where we can observe individuals using our product. And to pair that data with the quantitative data that backs it up gives us a really beautiful picture of, of how the user is performing. And it's very true. Uh, children and adults learn very differently, and there are other factors at play. Uh, adults are rather autonomous in their purchasing patterns. Uh, children are rather tied to uh, individuals and parents, for example, who are responsible for paying for the products, right? <laughs> so uh, <clears throat> accounting for those idiosyncrasies and and building up models to account for uh, those those differences, those subtle differences, is how we keep uh, building in several verticals. Charlie, you're speaking at conferences all over, and in one of your presentations that I saw, you say that the right data informs the micro successes and failures of the product. Can you talk a little bit about the importance of analyzing the right data and asking the right questions? Oh, absolutely. Um, we. We're in a time right now where the typical cycle of product iteration <clears throat> is getting really, really short, and it needs to be to be competitive. Um, there are companies that refuse to build a new version of a product um, in faster iterations than maybe a year or two, and we'll, we'll quickly see that those products are, are made obsolete. The ones that are truly sustainable are the ones that are able to iterate every two weeks, like. Facebook's wow. able to iterate. Um, Rosetta Stone are pushing at that very aggressively. And how better to, the only way really you can in, infer how best to modulate the next uh, iteration of your product, the only way you can really properly do that is by extracting salient data about the experience while the experience is in the wild. Uh, if you make an uneducated guess about which way to iterate your product over a course of two weeks without implement without utilizing your data, you could find yourself making the wrong correction. Mm -hmm. So it's not enough to just be fast anymore. You have to be fast and right. And the only thing that can inform that is advanced analytics. Charlie, what are some of the data science products that you've worked on that's really excited you and, and has really helped with product development? Um, probably my favorite product. Uh, that I ever worked on from a data science perspective came from the previous company I was with. We were focused on uh, cybersecurity solutions where a cybersecurity solution where we were able to monitor insider threat as documents moved within the wild within the organization and exited to the wild. We were tracking all that information from a security standpoint. Well, we by chance uh, created data elements for that whole set that were super, super granular. That each datum constituted a single action that was taken on the XML or the PDF that the user had, had uh, worked with. And we found that once we were, once we had decided to make a foray into the consumer space, that the product itself had to adjust a bit. The product really couldn't serve as a, a compelling uh, cybersecurity solution. It really had to stand on its own as an operational uh, tool. So how best do we do that? You know, this is a, a big challenge for us to really conceive and, and to, to work through. So we actually modulated using the same data uh, 
the product into one that would be able to actually give insight onto how effective employees were working or how workflows panned out within an organization, how effective employee was it when they were working from home, uh, how much activity there was on a Friday afternoon in a certain company. Mm. And we were, we were able to do that by simply uh, accessing the same data that we had previously and um, applying a different set of visualizations to uh, create a dashboard for that data. But all of that was granted because of the fact that we started off with very, very granular data. That's great. What, what would you say is, is vital for a data scientist to know uh, when working with data to gain insights or product development? And are there any easy mistakes to make when doing that? There are many. And they're, they're not the ones that you would have anticipated, you probably anticipate. Um, let's say, uh, for argument's sake, that you've already been able to accumulate a, a whole corpus of different data <clears throat> from different repositories, and they're all normalized, and they're sitting in your infrastructure, and now it's your time to operate. That, by the way, that process is typically about 90% of a data scientist's objective mm -hmm. when, when dealing with a new company or a new uh, problem. Once that data has been accumulated, what is very common in data science is to, is to not abstract enough from the data itself um, to be able to build a set of metrics and dashboard that's useful for the, the uh, end user. Uh, too often, data scientists get saturated with, oh, how great would this be to present this data in this way? How great would it be to present data in this way? When really what they should be focused on is the perspective of the end user, the operations, uh, the, the, the operational uh, leader, the uh, CPO, CFO, whoever ends up taking a look at this data in the end, they need to be able to put themselves in their shoes enough that they can, they as that leader with that background would be able to infer correctly from the data what the data is telling them. And without that level of abstraction and empathy, uh, then you can often see data science prog programs get very far out of sync with the, with the company. Uh, the, what I always like to say is <clears throat> two things. One, it's an extremely quantitative process um, for, a, for a big chunk of the time, about 90% of data science is extremely quantitative. <clears throat> but the best uh, data scientists remember that the last 10% needs to be extremely qualitative, extremely UX driven, uh, and extremely conscious of what the user is going to go through. And I'll, I'll also tie that with one of my favorite quotes, and I can't, can't remember who said it originally, but um, good, good designers, good engineers, good architects design what they think the user wants, what is that product that the user wants, but the best uh, unequivocally design a product based around why the customer is, is looking in the first place. So, you know, if, if a user knows that they want to see a chord diagram with a D3JS backing, or if, they, if we know that they want to take a look uh, at our metrics, um, that's, that's just well and fine, but you need to know what's what it is that's driving them, not what it is that they've explicitly, explicitly stated is what they're looking for. I think you bring up a really good point because you can come up with all the greatest data in the world, but if you're not presenting it in the right way, um, helping the person actually realize how this data is useful, then you've not, you've not really done your job. Oh, absolutely. And worse than that, um, you can often, I mean, data, running the data science department is not an inexpensive endeavor. Uh, and oftentimes they're brought in and data science organizations are brought in expressly to try and turn a company around uh, when they're in a, in a point where they really need to be incredibly lean and strategize about how best to, to cut back on their spending. So uh, it can be a recipe for a big challenge. Charlie, you know that the data science field is growing and it, it just seems like more and more I'm hearing about companies starting labs and hiring more scientists and is definitely a hot field right now. What advice do you have for those people who are interested in, in breaking in uh, to work in data science? Um, and advice for them for those that want to be helping to improve products and user engagement? Uh, I believe <clears throat> that, the data, that data science is truly the amalgamation of three different fields. It's, it's really the, the confluence of three different fields in which um, engineering is very important. Knowing the tools that are at your disposal is, is imperative, um, but not any less so than a rigorous mathematic and scientific background. Uh, and, and of course, the third element is UX, understanding people and users. 
those three tool sets in tandem, um, uh, engineering, science, mathematics, science and mathematics, and, and UX understanding are non-negotiable skill sets that a use, a, an individual must, be to, must have in order to be a, a proper data scientist. Um, that's kind of the foundation. What is also incredibly important is the ability to synthesize different paradigms and different problems very quickly, very abstractly, and then be able to merge those two to identify commonalities that are important. Charlie, what advice do you have for the, the CIO, the CTO, um, the senior leaders that are hiring data scientists? What should they be looking for in a data scientist? And how can they, how can they keep these data scientists happy in their work? <clears throat> um, that's a very challenging question. Uh, a a C, CIO who's responsible for hiring a data scientist needs to keep in mind that uh, typically these individuals are will not come from a single discipline. Oftentimes they have many, many disciplines that they have exposure to, and it's a prerequisite for being a, a, a very talented data scientist. You don't want to find yourself in a position where you're hiring somebody who is an expert in MySQL and has been for the last 30 years. That's not a pro, pro, uh, an appropriate data scientist. Mm -hmm. You also don't want to hire an individual straight out of college who's just majored in um, computer science with maybe a minor in, in literature. What you're looking for truly <clears throat> is an individual who right off the bat during an interview, you can tell they see the world in a different way, um, but they also have uh, the ability to tie that back to direct impact on RLI and uh, business acumen. Um, that is often very overlooked when hiring a data scientist. They'll be brought in from NASA or from uh, one of the top government labs, and it's assumed that if you're a scientist, you'll make a great data scientist. But it is not; it is necessary, but not sufficient to be an, an excellent scientist. You also have to be able to uh, empathize, as we talked about earlier, and also be able to abstract the business objectives enough so that you can bring uh, profitable tools into the company. Well, Charlie, I want to thank you so much for, for joining this chat today. Where can others learn more about you? Um, LinkedIn's always a great way to reach out to me. Um, I'm uh, quite available. I, I make as, as much time as I, as I can to, to respond to questions and, and uh, interesting problems. Um, <clears throat> if, uh, I assume that information will be shared here, but uh, also feel free to email me if you have major challenges or questions or interested in building out a data science team or understanding more about what data science can offer, um, then, then please feel free to reach out. Um, I consult in a number of different companies. I, I serve on the board uh, of a number of different firms, and I'm, I'm always available to, to assist. Well, Charles, thank you so much for being our guest today. Um, if you'd like to learn more about Charles, I'd like to see links to his social profiles, you can go to our Experian blog where we'll have the video, uh, the podcast, and more detail, details about Charles. And the short URL is going to be ex.pn slash Charles. Also want to let you know that we have our data talk um, on Twitter every Thursday at 5 p.m. Eastern. And we would love for you to join our next conversation. You can find out about upcoming data talks by going to experience.com slash data talk. I want to thank you again for joining our data talk today. And we look forward to talking and tweeting with you all next week. It's been my pleasure. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you so much, Charlie. Of course.